Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Dr. Lewis Kaplan of the New England Medical Center, Tufts University School of Medicine. We're here in Boston, and it's June the 29th, 1994. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Miller Fisher. Uh, I'm going to interview Dr. Fisher, beginning with a little bit of his background, uh, his early years in Canada, uh, something about his medical training and medical education, a little bit about the war years, and then try to move on to more recent uh, things and ideas. Perhaps we could start with some of the early years, Dr. Fisher, maybe growing up in Canada, some of the early kind of events in your life. Well, thank you very much, Lou. Uh, uh, I'm greatly indebted to you for you taking the time out from your busy day to participate here. Well, to start at the at the beginning, I was born in uh, Waterloo, Ontario, Canada. It's, it's a, it uh, was a small town at that time, perhaps 2,500 or so, and uh, quite a uh, conventional town of those of those years. And uh, I attended the local public schools and then went on to the high school and. Uh, so I would say that the early education was uh, not unusual at all. And that's what practically everyone in town did. Yeah. Only a minority went on to college. The only outstanding feature there was that uh, I did manage to win a scholarship to the University of Toronto mm -hmm. to uh, enter medical school. What did your folks do? Well, my father was the, the superintendent of agencies for a, a large insurance company that had its head office in Waterloo, Ontario. Mm -hmm. And uh, so his uh, background was not uh, professional. Uh, a good deal was uh, was of his own doing, and um, in later years I found out he had taken many courses by by mail, mm -hmm. and uh, I still have those books at home. I've never I've intended to look them over, but I never have. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother was a housewife, and. Uh, she unfortunately died in childbirth when uh, when I was 11, mm -hmm. so that um, I then had a stepmother, but mm -hmm. um, and I had uh, four brothers and four sisters in the family, mm -hmm. so um, I was never lonesome. Mm -hmm. Which one were you in the family? Number three. Oh. Mm -hmm. What do you think, looking back on it, got you interested in? medicine later? Was it interest in science or interest in medicine or? No, it was very simple. They, from the age of perhaps 11 or 12, I was always the doctor in the family. Mm -hmm. So that was, uh, there was no discussion at any time as to what I was going to do. So it was very natural that I would go to high school and then and go mm -hmm. into medicine. And, and I don't know where that started. I, I, I never asked my father uh, who started that. Mm -hmm. what, what do you suppose? That, was, it in, was it an altruistic interest in, in people or was it an interest in science? Was it some well, person that was a doctor that was a role model in the community? Yes, I can't. Mm -hmm. I, I never found that out. Uh, mm -hmm. But it uh, was a useful career to enter. And uh, I think the doctors in our town were held in high esteem, uh, uh, remarkable figures. So I, I imagine it uh, stemmed from that. Mm -hmm. Did you have any personal contact with any of the doctors in the community before then? Not really, uh, just as a patient or something mm -hmm. like that, or looking mm -hmm. after members of the family mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. How did your folks respond uh, to this in the beginning? Were they very much interested in academic careers or serving? What was their kind of attitude? Yes, I can't uh, speak for that, but I would th think it would be more in the service uh, mm -hmm. contribution rather than the scientific. Mm -hmm. 
Now, when, when you were growing up, let's say in grade school or high mm -hmm. school, mm -hmm. were you a serious student? No, not never. Mm -hmm. but, uh, uh, I suppose uh, I never did any homework until <laughs> still I was 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. Not 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 a single word. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what was your interest in those days? Everything else. <laughs> uh, I was Sports, a, girls. Well, uh, uh, girls wouldn't enter into that in mm -hmm. that in those days. I mm -hmm. mean, we'd. Uh, uh, say at the age of 15 or 16 there might be some puppy love or something like mm -hmm. that but no that wasn't uh, that wouldn't be an interest at all I was a swimmer I was a uh, one mile and two mile uh, distance swimmer so that always takes an hour or two so uh, mm -hmm. that kept me out of mischief mm -hmm. and then um, every kind of sport and uh, my father was a great sportsman and the, we had a uh, nine-hole golf course on our mm -hmm. around our property so that uh, in our spare time we were all out putting mm -hmm. it was more or less a putting course and uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, building model aircraft uh, uh, and kites uh, fishing mm -hmm. uh, picking berries in the in the uh, spring and you know, mm -hmm. uh, wildflowers my father would take us to to the woods for on all of these occasions so that uh, never bored never, was always, he interested in nature was nature a part of the interest in in biology or no not at all no, really. no he's, a, he's a, a sportsman if i had to mm -hmm. say he, was, he played hockey until he was mm -hmm. getting on in years mm -hmm. so that when you were finished with high school were your marks good in high school yes i, I, I won that Mm -hmm. a scholarship uh, mm -hmm. as I mentioned and uh, so the last couple of years in high school I, I did uh, turn turn up the burners mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and and that uh, established me as the mm -hmm. leading scholar in the, in the high school mm -hmm. so that uh, mm -hmm. so that was the first inkling that uh, that I uh, could be a serious student mm -hmm. When you went to college then, the college was really, I guess in Canada there's a six-year medical school program that also has uh, liberal arts involved in it? Yes, well, it's a, it was, it's a six-year medical school or a seven-year that combines arts and medicine. And I took yes. that, that the seven-year course yes. and, uh, and uh, that way we receive a BA at the end of four years, Bachelor of Arts mm -hmm. at the end of four years, and then we have the final three years with medicine mm -hmm. medical students. And you went to the University of Toronto? Right, that, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. What were some of the things that happened in medical school? Some of the influences on your life? or What's your reaction now looking back on medical school in those days? Well, in those days there were almost uh, no full-time uh, medical mm -hmm. teachers at all. And it was pretty well laissez-faire. If you didn't get it today, you would get it tomorrow. And you could repeat your year if you failed it. And there were people around who had uh, perhaps failed the three or four years. And so they were in medical school for 10 or 11 years mm -hmm. and, uh, and were very good doctors. So that there was no pressure. There was uh, literally no pressure to, and no encouragement to do anything. Mm -hmm. I uh, once went to the medical floor in the hospital to practice up on heart sounds and breath sounds too. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chief saw me there and he says, what the heck are you doing in here on a nice day like this? Get your out of here, do you see? Something like that and, mm -hmm. and go and play ball or something. So it was, mm -hmm. it was a there was no, there was not the pressure of of today, mm -hmm. students. Was it was it a very academic environment, or what what was the environment like in the, at the hospital at that time, in the medical school? Well, uh, the the last three years yeah. of, in the last three years, uh, we were divided up into clinics of about twelve students each, and um, if you wanted to listen you could and if you didn't want or you uh, 
which we'd get it another day. Mm -hmm. So there was no no great supervision. Mm -hmm. I doubt if any any physician ever called me by name, <laughs> or or anybody by name. Mm -hmm. Did you have much patient interaction or any patient responsibility at that time? No, none. Mm -hmm. We would be assigned uh, patients to write up and mm -hmm. uh, perhaps one each week mm -hmm. and that we'd receive marks for that, but never any participation. Mm -hmm. No, that's, uh, that's an important uh, innovation mm -hmm. since our time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And during the kind of uh, medical school time then, uh, were you a serious student? Were you very seriously motivated at that time? Or? Not really. Uh -huh. No, I, I lived in a, 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 a men's house, and um, uh, we played a lot of bridge and, uh, and uh, high jinks and so forth, and a lot of sports. So we were always uh, out uh, throwing the football around or playing softball or uh, playing hockey or basketball or uh -huh. almost anything except studies <laughs> because of the this attitude that uh, if you don't get it today you'll get it tomorrow yeah now was were your were there any other people that kind of influenced you to push seriously or was it what you did more intrinsic to yourself and kind of self-motivated yes I, I was I was never uh, a never serious student and uh, I would mm -hmm. make the I could make the grade but the idea of, uh, of working hard to achieve a, uh, a top grade uh, never occurred to me. Mm -hmm. And um, a, one of our housemasters said, don't, don't wear yourself out when you're young. <laughs> or, 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 yes, or you might not be able to do anything. You've used up everything. You won't be able to do anything when you're old. Mm -hmm. so, but uh, I don't know if there's any. Were you, though, innately inquisitive at that time? I mean, were, were, was there much in, in the way of drive to solve questions or problems? Uh, oh, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yes. if, a, if, there, if a problem came up, I would have to stay with it uh, um, indefinitely. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, then chemistry, I paid attention to chemistry so that, and biochemistry, so that I, physiology, so that I always, always perhaps was the class leader mm -hmm. in chemistry and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and physiology mm -hmm. and, and physics, so forth, mm -hmm. so that I did like the, the sciences, that was definite. And was it because of the kind of problem solving or logics of it, or what do you think about those subjects were particularly stimulating? Yes, I wouldn't like to to mm -hmm. to answer that. It, 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 they have a beginning and an end, somewhat, mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, English literature, or uh, the history of religion, or philosophy, mm -hmm. see, would not would not have any immediate answer at all. Uh, Too vague. I suppose so. Mm -hmm. So you were into, in a way, searching and looking for answers and tackling problems that could be tackled? Not, not no. consciously, no. No, it was, all, <laughs> it was all just going along with the, with the flow. <laughs> what do you remember now when you were in medical school, thinking about the future? Where, where were you headed at that point? Uh, oh, and I was uh, going into internal medicine. Mm -hmm. a, a surgeon friend of the family said, don't, don't go into surgery. He said, I, I'm a surgeon and all I'm interested in is in medicine. <laughs> so <laughs> I think he was kidding me, but uh, so. But uh, did you have any interest in neurology at that time? Oh, no, not at all. There was no mm -hmm. neurology. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, neurology at the hospital was part of medicine. And uh, I don't think we even saw a stroke. I, I don't think I ever saw a stroke. I never heard of neurology. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Mm -hmm. Pathology was strong. That's mm -hmm. see, that was a, 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 a that was definite. So mm -hmm. Pathology was something, but the knowledge of medicine was still very vague. You know, mm -hmm. had, had diabetes and uh, insulin, a few things like that, but mm -hmm. uh, no anti no antibiotics. You see, at all. So uh, mm -hmm. that hadn't come. None of the antis had come yet. Mm -hmm. There was a, almost. Yeah. Must have been some ways a frustrating period. Not at all. No. <laughs> no, it was uh, uh, 
they just, you sort of went to school, and at the end of six or seven years, you were shoved out, and uh, then you had to do a, a residency. Oh, no, some, went, some went directly into practice. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I don't know what they would be up to, but... Uh, now, you graduated from the University of Toronto. Right, what, yes. what year was that? 38. 38. 1938. Right. And then, then what happened? Well, I interned at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, mm -hmm. and that was a top-notch place. It was, it was in its heyday. It was a, uh, every department head was a, uh, was a, st was a star, really. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a very stimulating place. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so that uh, I, I perhaps could have stayed there in, in, a, in a career, mm -hmm. but I was a member of the Reserve Army, mm -hmm. see, and that was in, in, in August of 39, before the war started. Mm -hmm. Oh, was that something that Reservists was... were, were notified. Mm -hmm. Is that something that everyone did at that point, or you felt a special wish to do No, I had been a, uh, a reservist in, in, uh, in high school and in college. So, I see. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that then you were really, what, what happened after that first year then? Were you called up, or you volunteered uh, to go in? Yes. No, I, no, I was notified to, to stand by. I see. Something of that sort. So I returned to Canada, uh, to Montreal, and while waiting to be called up, I went up to the Royal Victoria Hospital to uh, see if they, uh, if I could uh, be occupied there. Well, they had several British house officers who were already on their way back to Britain. Mm -hmm. So there were openings in medicine, and uh, I was taken on the in medicine at the Royal Victoria Hospital. Now you would have finished your internship here at Ford, so you would have been yes, yes, at I, this point a, a junior resident. Yes, right. In medicine, mm -hmm. right. right. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. So that was at the Royal Vic, and and then what happened? How long were you there before you actually went in the army? Uh, the following uh, April. Mm -hmm. So that would be about uh, six months or mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Did that? Was there any differences between how it was at the Royal Victoria and Henry Ford? Were there any changes in your direction or how you were functioning at that? No, I, I was just waiting to, to go into the service. Mm -hmm. I, had, uh, I had an interest in, in uh, metabolic disease by that time. Mm -hmm. And antibiotics had just started. Uh, sulfadiazine, mm -hmm. you wouldn't remember that. Yes, but, I remember. And, um, in, at Henry Ford, uh, sulfadiazine was, uh, was it, oh, sulfapyridine, sorry, okay. excuse me. Uh, sulfapyridine was introduced for pneumonia. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, as I recall, the uh, chief of pulmonary medicine ran a, a randomized series with uh, sulfapyridine in pneumonia. Is that right? And uh, shall we say three, three did not get it and two got it. Mm -hmm. And he said the experiment is over. <laughs> Everybody gets sulfapyridine. So the, the, the numbers were not more than five. N, N was no more than five. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that because the, 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 the ones who did not get the mm -hmm. sulfapyridine were becoming very, very ill, you see, and entering, perhaps going to lose their lives, whereas mm -hmm. the, the two who got it were able to be up and eating and so mm -hmm. forth. So, so it was a, it was big, a big, big hospital for, uh, they had many, they had whole floors of pneumonia patients, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, uh, oxygen tent had just been introduced, mm -hmm. it was just uh, Mm -hmm. starting so mm -hmm. and that was the only really antibacterial agent that was available at that time that's right yeah. uh, the, the uh, our, our cynicals perhaps for cephalus or something like that yeah. but, um, how did it happen that you were called into the service it was it just one day you got a letter or uh, no I, I was I was in the I was a uh, infantryman mm -hmm. so that uh, waiting to be called up uh, and uh, and in the hospital, the, uh, the, um, one of the senior surgeons mm -hmm. was in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And there was not, not, nothing for a surgeon to do in the Navy. We didn't have a Navy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, he applied to, 
I don't want to bore any of the mm -hmm. listeners no, here, but uh, they, he got permission to transfer to the army and go to Europe. Mm -hmm. If he could get someone to take his duties with the Navy. <laughs> so <laughs> he, uh, at lunch one day, said, how about it? So um, I said, well, that suits me. I said, it doesn't matter. I'm just marking mm -hmm. time until I, until I get called up. So whether it's the Navy or Army, doesn't make much difference. Mm -hmm. So that's, so I went into the Navy. That's how you got into the Navy. Right. Yeah. And, so. yeah. Now, I know that the, or the experience during the war was a very important part of your life later. So maybe talk about that a little bit. Well, the, um, I, I went overseas I, when, when France mm -hmm. fell and, and Dunkirk, the mm -hmm. evacuation of Dunkirk was on. They called for uh, people from Canada to go over as, as uh, surgeon lieutenants. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been told never to volunteer, but when they asked me I, I, uh, to mm -hmm. acquiesce so that uh, uh, 12 of us went over to England in, in uh, September of 1940. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the underwent some training at Portsmouth in southern England mm -hmm. and then I went to sea and mm -hmm. uh, in a, a cruiser uh, patrolling the waters between uh, Norway and Iceland and out the, uh, up in that direction all that winter of uh, 40 to 41 mm -hmm. and then came down into Halifax mm -hmm. uh, I think in about uh, end of March mm -hmm. of 1941 and we were supposed to have a rest because we had been mm -hmm. at sea for a long time. And mm -hmm. um, but when I went ashore, uh, a British surgeon on another cruiser had become ill, and they were ready to sail. Mm -hmm. So I was sent to join that ship, and I went to sea almost immediately. I see. And uh, so I didn't get much of a rest. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we uh, we'd been in the North Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And uh, this ship then went into the South Atlantic, so mm -hmm. that soon I was down in Trinidad, mm -hmm. uh, knowing nothing about tropical disease at all. Mm -hmm. So that um, then we we were going to sail for Freetown mm -hmm. to to pick up a convoy mm -hmm. to take a convoy from Freetown in West Africa mm -hmm. up to England, mm -hmm. and. Um, well, we, we never made it. We ran into a, a German a, a, a cruiser mm -hmm. about halfway across the Atlantic, and uh, and uh, we were sunk in the action. And oh, so, um, so the boat was sunk. Right. Yes, and um, the uh, and I thought that was it. I was in the water about uh, about nine hours in all, oh. and uh, perhaps eight hours. But the uh, German cruiser came back in the afternoon and picked up survivors, mm. so that uh, that's why I have to thank them. Mm. Otherwise, was this in the winter time? Was the water quite cold? Or well, it uh, it was uh, in uh, I think April the uh, mm. April the second. Uh, mm. I think but, uh, April the fourth. I think we were mm -hmm. sunk on April the fourth. So no, the water was balmy. No, it mm -hmm. wasn't. Uh, but there were sharks. So that's the uh, mm -hmm. uh, you had to. Well, I do. I obviously wasn't attacked, but uh, mm -hmm. others were. Mm -hmm. So the German uh, picked us up, and, and uh, then were taken to France, and then into Germany. Mm -hmm. And I was in there for about three and a half years. Now that was a kind of what was the setting like? Was it a, a real prisoner of war camp, or? Oh yeah, well, uh, most uh, almost all uh, naval prisoners. Mm -hmm. The uh, and uh, the. And all the merchant seamen, all the people picked up from sunken merchant ships were in a, one section of the camp. So mm -hmm. it was in all perhaps uh, 2,500 in, in all. Mm -hmm. But in the first days, we were in large prison camps uh, with, say, 60 or 80,000 mm -hmm. of uh, uh, French and Poles, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the later Russians, and so mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about the prisoner of war camp. What, if you look back upon it, is there anything you think is important to 
talk about for those, those years? Not really, but I, I was able to be a, a medical officer all of the time, so that uh, I was, I had something, something to do. I had a, a sick bay parade uh, every morning and mm -hmm. um, responsible for sanitation and uh, trying to control bed bugs and all, all that scabies and so mm -hmm. forth. And, uh, and uh, that uh, kept me busy in, a, uh, in that way. It kept me busy as an exaggeration because mm -hmm. uh, when you have young people, uh, mm -hmm. I, I, if I can say it, when there, there's, no, there's no wine, women, or wheels, mm -hmm. nobody gets sick. So mm -hmm. that they, um, uh, there was very little to do except for the wounded who uh, were brought in and, and, mm -hmm. and they were tended by uh, all of us. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't much to do. And uh, uh, neuroses uh, uh, really uh, didn't occur. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any hysteria. Um, panic attacks, uh, perhaps, or desperation. I, I can't stand this any longer. I'm going through the wire tonight and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that uh, only to a uh, small extent. So there was very little uh, mm -hmm. serious uh, medical uh, work to do. Mm -hmm. And I had a little, a little sick bay of, uh, I think, uh, perhaps, um, 12 beds, mm -hmm. and uh, most of the time they were empty. And uh, had, we had a few cases of tuberculosis that we had to tend uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, in isolation. So what would, what would I do? Um, well, as I've often said, I, I, I went to graduate school, mm -hmm. and um, I read widely in, in every conceivable field that we could get books on. Mm -hmm. and, but history, uh, English literature, uh, say Shakespearean mm -hmm. works of all kinds. Uh, uh, I would re I'd read them all mm -hmm. at some time or another. And, and then mathematics, navigation, physics, calculus. I took a class in calculus mm -hmm. so that uh, later on when I came home, I thought that I had possibly enjoyed the, the arts mm -hmm. enough to know that there's nothing out there very much, that it's a, a luxury. But I had been there, and when I came home, I was ready to go to work, and, and mm -hmm. I think felt that I, I didn't miss, that mm -hmm. I ha hadn't gone into medicine and missed the world. Mm -hmm. And that's Nowadays, people are so busy in medicine that they, when they get to be 35, mm -hmm. they feel that something has passed them by. That, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's one aspect that I, uh, that is a recompense. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I was very far behind in medicine. The mm -hmm. fellow I room with, mm -hmm. I just want to, if I may interrupt, the fellow I room with, uh, had medical books that were sent to him by the Red Cross, and he would read them from uh, beginning to end and underline them the once in red, and then the next mm -hmm. year they'd be in green, and the next <laughs> time in yellow until he didn't, couldn't see the print. But I'd ask him a simple little question. He said, he said, I think I read that, but I don't remember the answer. And that taught me not to read without seeing patients. Mm -hmm. he, he taught me that, so I didn't mm -hmm. bother reading medicine because I I wasn't seeing patients. Mm -hmm. but, uh, well, uh, but it sounds like you were a fairly serious student for a lot of other things. So you were kind of seriously uh, using your time anyway. Yes, it was more more uh, enjoyment or mm -hmm. keep busy, uh, mm -hmm. keep your mind off. Mm -hmm. See, it, in the early days, the Germans would taunt us with the idea that we would never we would never get home. Don't don't kid yourselves. And if you do get home, we're, it's going to be in a basket because we'll shoot you all before you get out of here. Mm -hmm. So that's when they, when they were in Moscow and in mm -hmm. Cairo and uh, on the uh, all through the Greek mm -hmm. uh, peninsula and so forth. Uh, nothing seemed it 
No, there was a feeling in the camp that we'd be lucky to ever ever see it night. So we had to keep busy and, and do something. Was it a pretty frightening experience? Well, uh, the the morale was uh, seeing the the morale was always good. Mm -hmm. The the British are, have uh, an extremely uh, tough fiber. You mm -hmm. you can't you can't get them down and they would bring us out on parade and, and announce that we hope that none of you men has friends on the hood that's HMS hood of the giant battleship mm -hmm. because the hood gesunken ist <laughs> it is a parade yeah. and the British would cheer and holler and clap and so forth yeah. and the, the Germans just have to walk away these, these mm -hmm. people are crazy so any bad news that was given they cheered mm -hmm. so you couldn't you couldn't get them down and the and the cockney is a tough uh, yeah. you know you can't uh, uh, you can't control a cockney even when you have a rifle pointed mm -hmm. at him he won't he won't mm -hmm. obey so mm -hmm. um, so morale was good and then uh, we were up near Bremen Mm -hmm. And the uh, first wave of, of uh, U.S. daylight uh, attacks came in in that region near, near at Bremen, and that was in the, the spring of 1943. Mm -hmm. And uh, these flying fortresses in broad daylight, mm -hmm. just uh, was, I think there were perhaps 200 the first time. Mm -hmm. So there was right in our uh, in our front uh, living room. We saw the the whole thing just uh, within uh, the whole thing was within 12 miles of us. And uh, but that told us that the the war was was going to be over and that uh, the United States is going to win it. Mm -hmm. So that the, from there on, you see, it was just a matter of waiting. We knew that they that that this was so tremendous that it would it would decide the war. And, and uh, so that we didn't have a, a long time to to be in the dumps, right? mm -hmm. uh, perhaps two years and all, or something mm -hmm. like that. When did you finally get out of the? In September, camp? September 1944. 44. Yes, the the uh, uh, repatriated wounded and uh, mm -hmm. mentally ill and so forth were were sent home. They were supposed to have been sent home, you know, every six months or something like that, but the Germans couldn't agree and so the first group came home in mm -hmm. in September forty four. Mm -hmm. And we were assigned on mm -hmm. longevity in the camp, you see, and uh, and I wasn't due to come home, but uh, one of my colleagues, uh a named Peter Brownlees, uh was on the list and he said mm -hmm. Uh, he said, you have a, a family that you haven't seen, mm -hmm. uh, and I don't have a family, so I'm withdrawing my name, and yours is next on the <laughs> list. And mm -hmm. when I entered the service, the, the commander who, who uh, advised me at the beginning, he said, mm -hmm. uh, uh, have some advice for you, and he gave two or three things, and one of them was, if you, if you get a break, take it. <laughs> so when, when that came up, I thought of, of what was said to me, uh, you know, four four mm. years before. Take it, and I said, "Okay, Peter, I'll, I'll do it. I'll take it." Mm -hmm. So that's how I I got on yeah. this. Uh, mm -hmm. So I got home before the camp was broken up. Mm -hmm. by the, yeah. If you look back on it, now you were in the camp for about three and a half years. Yes, right. Right. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You were very much different when you got out of the service than when you had come back, gone back in, when you had gone in eventually, originally. Not, not really. I don't think so. I, I was very much behind in medicine. I, mm -hmm. I played bridge every day for, uh, for three years, uh, perhaps once or twice or three times a day, and uh, so that uh, we were, we were very good at bridge. Mm -hmm. I could have become a, a professional bridge player, mm -hmm. I, I think, because mm -hmm. uh, we were, we were. The, pair I was in was uh, we were the champions year after year so um, but when I came mm -hmm. home I, I almost never played bridge again mm -hmm. played with the family a few times in the first year and then never again so mm -hmm. what happened then when you came home well uh, I was uh, given six months refresher course in medicine and sent to the Royal Victoria Hospital for it mm -hmm. you see and uh, 
part of the six months was spent at the Montreal Neurological Institute mm -hmm. just across the way. So mm -hmm. that um, in, during those two months, I, I got became a little familiar with uh, mm -hmm. neurology, and and uh, Wilder Penfield asked if I would had ever considered uh, mm -hmm. neurology, which I hadn't really. I never even heard of the subject, probably. Mm -hmm. So and uh, so he offered me the job as registrar and uh, and uh, fellow in so neurology I, yes right so i uh, mm. I, I accepted that i had almost completed i had completed uh, my work for uh, the fellowship in the royal college of medicine mm -hmm. uh, i did get those exams but mm -hmm. and was going to go on into diabetes and metabolic mm -hmm. disease so mm -hmm. How does how was that decision made? I mean, was it just an opportunity that came up, or uh, uh, he was the star in at the Royal Victoria Hospital? Mm -hmm. Penfield. No, oh yes, right. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. And the and the Neurological Institute was the uh, prestigious place mm -hmm. in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I thought he was serious. You ever thought of neurology, and uh, so then he uh, invited me up to his office, and we chatted and so forth. And he says, "Well, the the, the job's yours if you want it." So mm -hmm. um, I said, "All right." Well, mm -hmm. so and I, at that point, you how much exposure had you had to neurology? Yes, about six weeks. Uh -huh. So uh, this my, my part of that two two months rotation. You see, mm -hmm. that's all, mm -hmm. and uh, the. It hinged largely on one case of a of a, an American officer who was admitted with uh, seizures that began with his hearing tom toms, mm. and uh, so I was assigned that case to work up, and then uh, so I spent the evening or the night looking up something about localization and so forth, and uh, didn't know where it lay in the whole history of epilepsy or focal epilepsy and uh, around the next morning said, well, where do you think it is? And I said, well, I think it must be close to Heschel's gyrus. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had no idea except by mm -hmm. reading overnight. And uh, mm -hmm. so he was very impressed. And I didn't realize that, that at that time uh, these things weren't settled uh, beyond all peradventure. They, uh, the cases were were not common at all so mm -hmm. to have a, a sound come from Heschel's mm -hmm. gyrus. So, uh, mm -hmm. so that was the beginning and, mm -hmm. and the rest. And then of it. what happened? How long did you spend doing that? Well, uh, I was there about two and a half years in all, mm -hmm. and so uh, up until January of um, 1949. So, mm -hmm. oh yes, yeah, I was. I was then discharged from the Navy. Mm -hmm. The Japanese War was still on. Mm -hmm. You see, and we were all sent uh, something. Uh, are you prepared to 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 go into the Japanese phase? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So, um, so as far as I knew, all my mm -hmm. colleagues said yes. All right, we'll we'll see it through. So, although I'd only been <laughs> been back a few months, I thought, okay, I'll sign it. Yes, and mm -hmm. if I sign no, it's a, you know it's embarrassing. Mm -hmm. So then I was discharged uh, in mm -hmm. 1946, I think, from the Navy. So it would be two and a half years then at the Neuro, the Montreal Neurological mm -hmm. Institute. And then uh, Wilder Penfield uh, thought that I should go uh, overseas for uh, further training and mm -hmm. say at Queen Square, mm -hmm. and um, which would be somewhat uh, difficult to do. And uh, uh, a fellow named uh, Roy Swank. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you yes, know I, of him. He's yes. a, a professor in, at Oregon. Uh, he had just come to the Neurological Institute from Boston City Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, if you, if you want any further training, there's only one place to, to go, and that's to Boston City Hospital under Raymond Adams. Uh -huh. So he called Raymond Adams and uh, told him about me. And uh, so then I called Raymond Adams later that day and told him what the prospects were and so forth. And uh, he said, well, if you don't need any money, come along. <laughs> so, uh, so just like that. He Is that right? Came, uh, so now you, by this time, 
Had you made up your mind that you were a neurologist? Not uh, probably, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, I had two and a half years now so had, mm -hmm. of, of clinical neurology. Right. Yeah. And if, if you look back on those Montreal years, what were some of the influences later? Was Penfield a, a major influence? Well, he, he ran the, the department. There's no question. He's, he's the, the bright mm -hmm. star, always. And um, uh, what happened in, in, mm -hmm. in Boston City Hospital was the, was the turning point. I see. Uh, Not uh, in originally in, Montre in Montreal then, as you look back on it. No, it, it couldn't have been, no. Mm -hmm. it, it, uh, it changed entirely in, in BCH. Mm -hmm. there, there wasn't any kind of influence in stroke when you were in Montreal. Uh, no, I'd done, uh, no, really not. I'd uh, uh, done a uh, follow-up of patients operated for hypertension, mm -hmm. and that was, that mm -hmm. was my only mm -hmm. interest in hypertension, really. Mm -hmm. Now, when you came to the Boston City, then, you would have been about how old? Well, that would be 49, so I'd be uh, 35. I see, right. And you were still single? Oh, no. No, no. When when no, did that happen? Uh, well, I was married in uh, in 1939 when I was called up. I see. see as soon as I was called, call, as soon as I was uh, in the draft, you see, or I see. called up, uh, I uh, my wife and I uh, uh, decided that uh, to be married. And I see. So you so were really separated then during those war years. Right. Yes. During right. That right. Time. right. Hmm. Right, okay. And then you, so you both really went to Boston then. Yes, right. right uh, period of time without any salary. <laughs> right. How did you get on? Uh, all going in debt. Mm -hmm. There's no, no money. So mm -hmm. I think the veterans something sent me $100 a month or something like that, mm -hmm. but um, mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. But at the, at, the uh, at Boston City Hospital, I worked in neuropathology. Mm -hmm. And with Raymond Adams, and uh, that of course is the the uh, turning point. I'd, I'd I'd probably be nothing mm -hmm. if I didn't do that. It's hard to say. It's hard mm -hmm. to say what would happen, but um, uh, they're immediately greatly impressed with the great knowledge of Raymond Adams and Derek Denny Brown. Mm -hmm. The a whole dimension of knowledge in medicine, mm -hmm. uh, wh whole diseases known uh, backwards and forwards in their entirety. Mm -hmm. A new experience for, for me. I'd never heard anybody know all about everything in, mm -hmm. in a disease. Mm -hmm. Everything that's known, new, new experience. So very impressive immediately. and. Uh, and then Raymond Adams seemed to always to know about everything in, in, in neuropathology. Keep everybody on the straight and narrow, not let them make flighty diagnoses and so forth. But the main uh, turning point was after I'd been there about two months and we were cutting uh, up, to, uh, up to 10 brains a, a day. Mm -hmm. we, we, they, were, they were doing 900 autopsies a year at BCH, mm -hmm. and in addition, at least two brains were sent in each week from around the country to mm -hmm. Ray for special studies and so forth. So if we even hesitated for a moment, uh, the brains would pile up. So mm -hmm. we'd, and this one day we had uh, uh, we had nine or ten brains to to cut, and the mm -hmm. fellow, the chief resident, had formal dermatitis and couldn't touch any brain and couldn't put away a brain. So I had to put away all the brains and I had to cut all the brains and he would stand behind or sit behind and direct me, you know, cut there and cut there and open that and do so forth. And after about two months, one day we were to start at one o'clock and he didn't come. He was, he was late. So while I was waiting, uh, I, I cut the brain and um, it had a hemorrhagic infarct. And mm -hmm. I, I didn't know what hemorrhagic infarct was at that time. It was a, 
it was uh, it looked bad, <laughs> but uh, very little known about these things. Yes. And uh, while waiting for him to come, uh, I looked through the vessels to to see if uh, there was a blockage, and. Uh, he didn't come, so I had uh, a good deal of time to uh, patiently look through quite a few vessels, and there was nothing there. And uh, I didn't, then he came along, and I didn't tell him. But brain number three was another hemorrhagic infarct. <laughs> and, uh, and I just said jokingly to him, the odd thing about these, you don't find anything blocking the vessels. He said, oh, come on. So, uh, so then we settled down and, and uh, dissected that out and didn't find any, any blockage of the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And number nine that day was another one, a third. So three came in one afternoon mm -hmm. of hemorrhagic infarction in people who with atrial fibrillation with strokes in different organs and so forth. Uh, so that in one afternoon, the idea that lysis of uh, emboli occur Mm -hmm. and that hemorrhagic infarction is related to embolism uh, uh, came, to, came to pass, that all in one afternoon, mm -hmm. in someone who knew nothing at all about anything. <laughs> I, I was as close to a complete ignorance as, as you could imagine. Mm -hmm. But so that was the turning point, you see, and, and Ray Adams said right away, oh gosh, he said, if that's true, he said, that's a, a, a Virchow didn't know this. <laughs> that no one, no one had ever got onto that. See, I didn't know that that day, but Ray said this is this is very important. And, uh, I guess Charles Foix had right before he died done a little bit of that, but I guess it wasn't really well known in. Uh, well, not not dissolution of emboli, no, yeah. no. They, they, I think the, I didn't find anybody who had who had. Uh, right. No, he he just dissected out. Uh, arteries that led to infarcts and oh, found yeah. a lot of times the vessel was open. Yes, but he uh, didn't talk about hemorrhagic infarcts. Right. No, and, that uh, wasn't well known. And dissolution of embolism was, mm -hmm. let's see, uh, well then within the next month we looked in the pulmonary vessels and my, it's the same there, the same thing is going on there with pulmonary mm -hmm. emboli, then mesenteric emboli, mm -hmm. so-called mesenteric thrombosis turned out to be mesenteric embolism. Mm -hmm. So that uh, in, in a few months, it uh, turned out to be a very, mm -hmm. a very interesting development. That mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and that that original paper, mm -hmm. I remember, that mm -hmm. was written. That I mm -hmm. guess you and Ray did right. on hemorrhagic yeah. infarction. Was that primarily your project, or was it oh. Ray that guided you through that? Or well, no, no, I, no, I, no. I, I then spent uh, almost a year in the library. I see. Uh, looking, uh, looking up the German literature on this. See, there's a lot on embolism for mm -hmm. the previous uh, 100 years, or well, the previous 80 years. So it's a tremendous literature to... And your German then, from the, from the prison work camps, came in handy. That's right. Looking that's, through Verkhoff yeah. and... Yeah. So that's really where you got some of the basic historical background about what the people had done in, the, yeah. in this field before that. Yes, you you, mm -hmm. you can't make progress without knowing what's gone before, mm -hmm. and that say that sounds uh, like a, a truism, but it isn't uh, mm -hmm. appreciated. That's that's what's always holding up mm -hmm. uh, the advance because you don't know where what you're studying where mm -hmm. it stands in the whole history of the of the disease or the process mm -hmm. or something like that. Mm -hmm which, and I, of course, did not know that, but in the next year, I, I began to appreciate uh, where this lay. And, and Was that the first paper that you had worked on? The hemorrhagic uh, infarct uh, paper? Uh, uh, really, yes. I'd written on, on uh, uh, the Babinski sign, a few things like that, but uh, mm -hmm. no, that was the first real. Uh, did you do the writing, or Ray did? Or no, I did it all. You did oh, it. that's right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And then, then what happened after that? Did this really turn you on, or did this change things for you? And well, I, I had become by that time I had become a neuropathologist, mm -hmm. see, uh, so-called. I mean, it mm -hmm. wasn't accepted by uh, anybody, but but I was about the only trained neuropathologist in Canada by that time. Is that after, after a year? Do you mm -hmm. see? Uh, so I could cut a brain, and I knew disease processes, and I and I knew vascular. I'm beginning to know vascular disease, mm -hmm. so that uh, and they gave me a nice uh, laboratory and appointment. At so you had gone, then after you did your time at the city, 
You had gone back then to... Right, at the end of a year I went uh -huh. back to, to Montreal uh -huh. and the Montreal General, they gave me a, a, a place in, in pathology uh -huh. and uh, began to admit stroke patients so that I was able to study perhaps three to four hundred stroke patients, uh, uh, brain, mm -hmm. brains pathologically in a year, and that would be a good many strokes among them. Mm -hmm. Did you also at that time do clinical work? Yes, I uh, was in the, in the veterans, and I had four half days at mm -hmm. the veterans, and they allowed me to do it all in one day, and I would start at eight in the morning and <laughs> go from eight till 12, and then from one till five, and then from about five until one a.m., so that uh, they, so I got six days of uh, tension meant for neuropath. I see. Uh, so that was a very important, a very important arrangement, mm -hmm. so that I could could be where the brains were being removed and mm -hmm. so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, by this time. I gather you were fairly serious now about, or if you want, turned on to the idea of, of stroke, or did, is that something? Well, that I was just, I was working on hemorrhagic infarction and so forth, mm -hmm. and I had got on to uh, border zone infarction. That was mm -hmm. the other thing that came out of Boston the city, the, mm -hmm. the idea of the, the nature of border zone infarction, which wasn't known. It turned out to be due to late, we didn't know what it was at that time. But uh, shortly after going back to, uh, to Montreal, I saw a patient with a, who'd had a stroke two or three years before, mm -hmm. and while I was writing it up, he said, he said that he went blind in the, in the eye before the stroke, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I assumed that, that it was a hemianopia. And, uh, and, uh, I always allowed the patient to sit in the office while I was uh, preparing the report. So that, and while he was sitting there, he was a uh, left hem hemiplegia, and he, and he said, wasn't it uh, funny that it came on the wrong side? He said, it, it went blind in one eye and I got paralyzed on the other. So he, I, I remember him saying that, but it didn't mean anything. But a few weeks later, uh, almost the identical story from another fellow with a left hemiplegia, and he said, it wasn't funny, he said, I went blind in the right eye and I get paralyzed in the left. So two and three weeks again, that, uh, so uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what to make of that. Mm -hmm. so, and then the, uh, the carotid occlusion at that time was thought to uh, sometimes, uh, was sometimes associated with blindness in the ipsilateral eye and paralysis on the opposite side. So the idea that this could have been a transient something in the carotid came to mind. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I kept, I asked other stroke patients, and I assumed that there was a third who gave the same mm -hmm. type of history. And um, within two or three months, the first fellow died from carcinoma of the, of the large bowel. Mm -hmm. And uh, he died when, when I was out of the city. Mm -hmm. And when I came back on Monday morning, uh, uh, they said, you know, so-and-so uh, died. And, and I said, oh, is that right? I said, you know, did they get the autopsy and so forth? And they s said, no, there was there, no autopsy was, was performed. And um, so uh, reluctantly, I called the wife because she mm -hmm. knew some, some of my interest in her husband. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, reluctantly, I called her and, and uh, she said, well, I, I, I asked them if they'd like to do an autopsy and they said it wasn't necessary. <laughs> so, uh, well, you know they, well, how disappointing that can be. So, so I asked her if, if uh, could we do it in the uh, funeral parlor? Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, absolutely, that's perfectly all right with me. It was very, it was, uh, uh, unusually uh, acquiescent or mm -hmm. agreeable in, in uh, mm -hmm. letting me do such a thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I was able to do autopsies because when I was with Ray Adams, everybody in neuropathology had to do, had to do 10, uh, tw had to do 12 general postmortems in the year. Mm 
And so I had done that. So that was again fortunate. Otherwise, I couldn't have gone down to the funeral parlor. Yeah. And at 11 o'clock that night, uh, the funeral director uh, and I did the autopsy and, and uh, limited autopsy, but we did mm -hmm. the heart and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, and, and for the first time, took out the carotids. Yeah. So now, but before that happened, did you have in mind that they would have carotid disease? Yeah, right. That's yeah. how I got the idea. That and you had collected a fair number of cases by then, had you? Uh, not really, no. Not, uh, not mm -hmm. really. I, it was just, uh, but I had to look up the literature. Mm -hmm. And one in the literature, uh, a surgeon had reported that the fellow went blind in one eye and the fell in, and he uh, found a block carotid by mm -hmm. arteriography. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think I knew that. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, no, it was, a, it was a just a... And we didn't do arteriography at that in those days. You mm -hmm. see, that was just starting, and um, mm -hmm. we didn't have the nerve to do it. So that, so then we I took out the uh, the uh, uh, right carotid mm -hmm. and uh, cut it at the at the ta at the so-called table, and mm -hmm. um, it was occluded. So so I think for the first time a, a clinical diagnosis had been mm -hmm. substantiated by a pathological mm -hmm. examination and uh, mm -hmm. so that was uh, that was fairly exciting mm -hmm. uh, when you're say you asked before about being turned on yes see now this is now we're getting turned That's on right. uh -huh. you see this is I see. Yes, the other was I didn't understand what that was all about, the, the, uh, mm -hmm. the hemorrhagic infarction and mm -hmm. lysis that took a, a year to sink in. Now here's something that was really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. And um, so then in, in two months, in, in 1950, the idea of carotid occlusion came, the idea that it could be associated with transient blindness, mm -hmm. The idea could be associated with transient ischemic attack, mm -hmm. and uh, that would be a prodrome to perhaps doing something about a stroke. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, what was the? And there was something else, uh, perhaps even surgery. Mm -hmm. it came, all came uh, mm -hmm. just like that in, yeah. in a period of, sure. of, uh, of five weeks. Yeah. Now I gather at that time. People really didn't know anything about transient ischemic attacks. There was very little written about that. Is that right? It's. Uh, I would say that there. Uh, it was just mentioned in passing that uh, mm -hmm. some people uh, seem to have a warning. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, I mean, you also went a lot to the library, and it sounds like your your modus operandi was really threefold, wasn't it? Really doing the pathology, doing getting the clinical details, and then reading about it, putting it in the context of what others had done. Is that...? Yes, you have to go always, always go back to the mm -hmm. beginning again and to find mm -hmm. out where your work stands in, 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 the, in the development of the... And as I remember knowledge. that first article, it was a very long, detailed, uh, really also recounting of what others had done, right. going back uh, into German re literature. Review of literature, and some right, of the, yes, right. right. And some mention of the in passing comments about transient ischemic attacks, but it yeah. really had gone into great detail to... Yeah, not, not, I would say that it really hadn't been mentioned mm -hmm. uh, to any extent. In, mm -hmm. in a meaningful context, no. Mm -hmm. uh, up to that time, there was nothing to be done about a stroke. Mm -hmm. There was no point in making a diagnosis and no necessity for a patient to be admitted to hospital. Mm -hmm. So that was, this was the, perhaps the start of the, the, that there might be something to be done. And then I used anticoagulants. Oh yes, that's the other thing mm -hmm. that I couldn't think of before. It was the use of anticoagulants. At that time? Right, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. So, mm -hmm. so almost immediately there was a, a very fine internist who was, mm -hmm. uh, I spoke to him and, and so we used, started to use heparin and Coumadin almost uh, immediately. Now, at the time you were doing the carotid work, was that 
the only thing you were really concentrating on, or were you also interested in a number of other ideas? Or I think uh, mostly that, mm -hmm. but I had I was removing all all brains in, mm -hmm. in perhaps 350 autopsies a, a year, and then uh, I had the material from a, a rather large old soldiers' home, mm -hmm. a thousand beds mm -hmm. where they were sent to really to end their days, mm -hmm. and remarkable illnesses uh, were occurring there of all types, mm -hmm. of many undiagnosed, and uh, so that was a very rich source uh, so that, uh, that I was trying to develop that. So you were really getting a lot of neuropathological data. Now the data that you were getting, the material, were you also looking at the arteries and the carotids at that time? So we began to take carotids out routinely. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, we took out, I believe, uh, 1,100 pairs, mm -hmm. and uh, in in uh, perhaps two or three years, or some two years, or something mm -hmm. like That's that. That's a tremendous three. amount. Yeah. But I had two mm -hmm. uh, two uh, young deaners uh, mm -hmm. who who did most of the work, and um, they were. They had not finished high school, and they were not the usual deaners. The usual deaner was a pretty tough customer, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, perhaps an alcoholic or something like mm -hmm. that. And they would do good work for a month, and then come in, and then not come in, and come then come in all beaten up and so mm -hmm. forth, and then uh, be pretty good for a while again. Mm -hmm. These two were quite different. They were young mm -hmm. people. And they became interested in the carotids, and they took out the carotids and the vertebrals mm -hmm. and the arch of the aorta, sometimes mm -hmm. in continuity. They stayed at night before the autopsy of the <laughs> next day was to be done mm -hmm. and did all of this so that mm -hmm. they just uh, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't get them down. Beautiful mm -hmm. dissections. So, so mm -hmm. I was freed uh, mm -hmm. of, of any responsibility after about the first two or three hundred. Mm -hmm. so. And then around this time, you were preparing. You were preparing the report on the carotid artery, the cases you had done. This is the yeah. early fifties. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. What happened regarding that first paper, the carotid first carotid paper? How well, was it received, and what what happened? Oh no, it was received uh, and, and published. Uh, it uh, uh, no, it was well received. The first. What encouraged me was, um, I don't want to be too boastful, mm -hmm. but uh, a British delegation of uh, medical people were touring North America mm -hmm. and uh, to, to see what's going on in medicine and so forth. And uh, they, were, they came to Montreal to take a ship back, to, to sail back to Montreal to, to uh, to Southampton, and uh, so they visited the Montreal Neurological Institute, and then visited the Montreal General Hospital, and the neurosurgeon, who was uh, uh, perhaps uh, one of the hosts, uh, brought them down into the uh, autopsy room to, to show what we were doing. Wow, that was nice. So I uh, put out, you know, 50 or 100 pairs and so forth, and showed them where the obstructions were and so mm -hmm. forth. And the leader of the delegation said, now we've been all through North America looking at interesting things. He said, this is beyond all the most impressive demonstration we've come across. So we, I wasn't sure what I was doing, uh, really, where it stood. But to have them say that, uh, then I thought, well, no, that's, uh, I better write this up. and, and uh, uh, so that was another Philip mm -hmm. to, uh, to... How long did it take to write that first carotid paper? Oh, not, uh, let's see, how long? I wouldn't uh, like to uh, Six say. months? From beginning to end? Possibly. Uh, Six months. Mm -hmm. And then what happened when you submitted it? No, that, that paper was published uh, yeah. uh, promptly. It was, yes. I see. There was another paper you might have been referring to, and that's the the embolism paper. I see. The embolism paper was, was never was never published. The di see. dissolution of emboli was never accepted for publication. He, we couldn't. Uh, neither Dr. Adams nor I could um, 
could persuade the editor to publish it. He thought we hadn't proved our point. I see. So that was your really first experience kind of dealing with editors and... Uh, yes, as I say, I was on to carotid and I yes. couldn't uh, be fussing with that uh, yeah. uh, uh, hemorrhagic infarction. Yeah. Now, in this beginning times, it sounds like there are lots of exciting things, particularly with the neuropathology. What was the milieu and environment like? Were, were they supportive and pushing you, or was it more you yourself now were kind of self-propelled and on target to do it? Oh, yes. It was the, I had the opportunity and, mm -hmm. and, and took it. And um, uh, very supportive by everybody around. I never, mm -hmm. I never asked for anything even a scalpel blade or a elastic bend or uh, or a one dollar. I never, I never, ever, I suppose, ever, even up to the present time, I've never asked for anything. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, uh, in Montreal, the, the boss of the hospital would ask, how am I doing financially? And uh, can he help along? <laughs> the dean of the medical school said, uh, anything I can do for you? Uh, so that uh, I was doing very well. And of course, you were making lots of money at that time. <laughs> well, not not a lot, but uh, able to support the kids. Oh the yes, oh yes, but, right. Oh, now, yes. did you have children by this time? Oh yes, no, mm -hmm. they were all. The family was mm -hmm. uh, all. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the three, there were three children. Mm -hmm. Were there any, uh, as you look back on it, other than Dr. Adams? Were there any people when you went back to Montreal that were particularly instrumental or role models or involved in, in your? Well, there are uh, many people who are very supportive because this would be mm -hmm. a new venture. Mm -hmm. There was the, to have a neuropathologist in a general hospital. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was, there was no neuropathology, I suppose, in the whole of Canada. Mary Tom mm -hmm. in Toronto possibly, mm -hmm. but I don't know if she was a clinician or not, I don't mm -hmm. think so. So this is a new venture and um, uh, uh, many people very, very supportive and very interested. The veterans mm -hmm. would uh, constantly come along and, and say, is there, can, is there anything they can do for me? Mm -hmm. uh, but there was nothing they could do. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to do it, uh, you know, yeah, it's a... By yourself. Yeah, but things a, sound like they were really doing, especially with the pathology. Now, at this point, you thought of yourself basically as a neuropathologist. Uh, no, as a clinician. Clinician. To, yes, a, a combined. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, not to be only in the lab, that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't satisfy, no. So the pathology was really a window into how to take yes, care it, of people. Yes, it, was a, it was a combined effort, I think, to mm -hmm. study the clinical via neuropath. Mm -hmm. Now this was in, I guess, the early 50s. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. When did you come back to Boston? In 54. Uh, how, how did that happen? Well, Dr. Adams had been invited to become chief at the Montreal Neurological Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, he uh, and uh, Wilder Penfield was uh, uh, quite insistent and persistent, and um, but Ray decided to, I should say, Dr. Adams uh, uh, decided to stay in, in Boston because he was given the chair of, at the, the Bullard professorship and the chief at the at MGH, mm -hmm. so that uh, that was hard to turn down to go to Montreal for, mm -hmm. and. But, but if he had gone to Montreal, then uh, we could have collaborated as we had in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, so that uh, when he became established at MGH, he asked if I would like to join him there. Mm -hmm. So it was at, uh, at a uh, meeting in Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were walking on the boardwalk, and, and he said, and, uh, and thinking about things, and uh, would you like to join me in at the Mass General Hospital? And uh, so we took about four more steps, and I said, I accept, something, something. like that. So that, mm -hmm. uh, um, so I had everything going in, in Montreal, but it's a, something untoward occurred that uh, uh, cooled mm -hmm. me, and that was about, uh, 
two, uh, two months before. The, I've, I've never, uh, I wouldn't mention his name or anything like that, but somebody very important in, in, in my career or even in the immediate future said uh, that uh, carotid work is to me a lot of crap. Mm -hmm. So that um, he said that doesn't belong down here at the Montreal General, that belongs up at the medical school in pathology. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I didn't, uh, didn't, I don't know if I even commented, mm -hmm. I just noted it. Mm -hmm. And then two months later I have the offer to go to Boston and I took mm -hmm. four steps and said yes. So mm -hmm. because of, of that incident, mm -hmm. I thought that meant that that there was this, uh, there must be other unspoken mm -hmm. criticism. Mm -hmm. of, uh, mm -hmm. And you had known Dr. Adams, of course, from before. So yes, was, right, uh, yes, right. And had known Boston a little bit. Mm -hmm. Was it difficult to leave Canada at that time, being a kind of a native Canadian? Well, it, uh, it does bring up uh, uh, pangs. Uh, and, um, and Montreal uh, had uh, perhaps 15 or 20 young physicians mm -hmm. of remarkable personality, most appealing fellows. You can hardly think I'm exaggerating, but I could go down a long list of, of almost, to me, perfect specimens. Mm -hmm. uh, friendly, good doctors, interested in high-level activity, friendly, mm -hmm. supportive, uh, just from the service. I'd, I'd mm -hmm. known them, some in the Navy and mm -hmm. some in the Army. Uh, so they were appalled that I would uh, would take my family back to, uh, out of mm -hmm. Canada. So mm -hmm. that uh, it um, uh, so there were two sides to mm -hmm. to, to the move, but mm -hmm. we've we've uh, never looked back. And I had been at Henry Ford Hospital. So you had you had some experience in Houston. yes, right. And right. I'd spent a year in Boston. Right. So that um, what was uh, your wife Doris's attitude toward coming to Boston? Whatever I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. she I, was I guess. Very I mean, after I took those four steps, I <laughs> did have to uh, put in a telephone call. Right. <laughs> but um, um, right, she's, uh, by that time she was into my career. I see. See, and that. Um, uh, nowadays wouldn't wouldn't play very well, but yeah. um, she uh, looked after the family and uh, and it was a, an extremely good mother to the children mm -hmm. and uh, and told me to go ahead and mm -hmm. and get my my career mm -hmm. uh, uh, forwarded if. If I could. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the early years when you would come back to, to Boston and we're now we're at the Mass General? What was that like? When I first returned? Yes. Well, I was now at the Mass General rather than Boston City Hospital, and, um, and my assignment was to, um, to, to do whatever I could. The, and this, these are probably uh, Ray Adams' uh, words. He said, uh, do what you can, and if if you if you can't hack it, if you can't do anything, that's all right with me. He said you can stay here as long as you, as you wish, mm -hmm. without without any promise of production. Now that's that's a fairly good invitation to yes. have, and uh, so we started a, a stroke service, and uh, I would think from day one, things just were popping, hour in and hour out. Well, you. Mm -hmm. uh, now, did you also, though, did some neuropathology when you first came, did you? Uh, well, just the vascular disease. Uh -huh. Dr. Richardson allowed me to consult and then finally really to, to do all the neuropathology of vascular disease. I see. And also, Dr. Adams was still doing some neuropathology at that point? The yes, right. Yes, he, he would take mm -hmm. the uh, Tuesday conferences, but mm -hmm. uh, not otherwise. He wasn't doing very much. And uh, I was given a, a neuropath laboratory technician, mm -hmm. first one, and then two, and then three. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that developed the idea of, of uh, serial sectioning, so that, uh, that I approached all, almost everything via serial section, that unless I knew what was 100 
sections down and a hundred sections up that I didn't know what I was looking at in mm -hmm. the single section. Mm -hmm. And that, that to me is the, is the, uh, my greatest contribution to myself to, uh, to get into serial sectioning and I've not been able to persuade anybody that I, that I know of. But, uh, mm -hmm. Now, how did you get the idea about a stroke service? That, there wasn't any stroke services anywhere is that, that I know of at that time. Right. Well, we just uh, uh, Herb Carp. Do mm -hmm. you know Herbert Carp? Yes, of course. And um, uh, we just started seeing stroke cases around, as consultants around the hospital and in the emergency ward with, without any ideas in mind. Mm -hmm. See if something wouldn't come to mind. Or some, see if something yes, see if something wouldn't open up, mm -hmm. and of course it it um, it opened up uh, almost immediately. Yeah. Now Herb at that time was a resident or uh, he was a fellow. Oh. He had finished his neuro neurological training and came to the Mass General for a little broadening. Right. Before and, returning. And came particularly to you to work with you. Uh, I, I doubt that. I think mm -hmm. that he wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't, he wouldn't have known about I me see. at the time that the arrangement was made. But Herb was really the first fellow. Yes, right. Right. Mm -hmm. And then did, did that give you an idea then to try to get subsequent fellows? Yes, because we were seeing so many, yeah. so many stroke cases uh, mm -hmm. and we saw them in, throughout the hospital and in the emergency ward and that's mm -hmm. uh, a lot of work. and. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could easily use two or three uh, fellows at, mm -hmm. at any time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, by this time, you were still working on the carotid? Yes, we took carotids out when, when I first mm -hmm. came to the Mass General, yes, and, and vertebrals mm -hmm. and so forth. When did the Lacoon idea, how did that start of get started? Well, that started at, the, at Boston City Hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in those days, hypertension was untreated. Mm -hmm. So that a brain after brain had these multiple uh, lacunes scattered mm -hmm. through them, mm -hmm. and um, the uh, what's the cause of this uh, didn't have an answer, and we were off in other directions. But this large group of cases with small strokes and small and these lacunes. That was ever present. If you if you mm -hmm. section brains, you mm -hmm. see within a week you'd know that uh, this this must have some significance. This or, mm -hmm. or even what 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 is this all about? Mm -hmm. And I found that the, that had been studied in some detail by the early mm -hmm. early French experts, mm -hmm. but no one knew what caused it. Mm -hmm. so now, I, did you kind of explore that or read about that at the time you were at the Boston City, or that came later? Yes, I would have uh, done that in Montreal. I, think I said that. So right. while you were seeing a lot of the neuropath specimens. Yes, I right. I'd started to look up Marie and, and uh, Marie's work. But were most of the pathological serial sections of the lacoons was that done more at the Mass General, or did that start in Montreal? That started in Montreal. Oh, I see. And and, and very difficult uh, mm -hmm. because the first ones were done in Saloidin, and mm -hmm. um, so they would take a year. Mm -hmm. To find out that there's that they were unsatisfactory, and and then I at first would stain only f every fiftieth section, mm -hmm. you see, and then after uh, some months find out that wasn't adequate that I had to do do them mm -hmm. more frequent. So I'd do it say every twentieth section, mm -hmm. and then uh, every tenth, and uh, every fifth, and every second. Mm -hmm. And uh, these, this all took months each time to, to get the finished product back to find out that, that it wasn't satisfactory. And then we used multiple stains. We would do an H&E, and, e, and then perhaps a myelin stain, and then a, uh, a fi fibrous connective tissue stain, and mm -hmm. so forth, uh, mm -hmm. e on each, mm -hmm. each group, of each, mm -hmm. e each uh, section. And I found out that uh, invariably they get mixed up, so that uh, section 500 would be followed by, say, section 1400 in in, uh, in an elastic stain, <laughs> and uh, to to spend hour after hour, sometimes weeks, trying to match them up, yeah. so that so that I finally got down to uh, cutting every staining every section and use only one stain, and, and then. I would think within 
within two months I, we, were, mm -hmm. we struck gold. But one case would take how many hours to really settle? To review it? Yeah. Uh, an hour. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. A, what a treat to get, a, mm -hmm. to get uh, 20 trays mm -hmm. of slides and uh, say on a Sunday evening just mm -hmm. put one uh, uh, after another under the microscope mm -hmm. and my gosh in 15 or 20 minutes you found the the blockage in the vessel for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. so, uh, again, exciting. Mm -hmm. that, to, that to me would be exciting to, mm -hmm. to, to, to use technology to, to establish something that's never been recognized before. Mm -hmm. In those early days, you know, at the Mass General, do you think a lot of the ideas and stimuli came more from the path material or more from the patient encounters and the stroke service? Or was it a mixture of both? Yes, uh, that's a uh, somewhat uh, difficult question to answer uh, with a yes or no. I always did the clinical and was interested in what was the cause of the stroke. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, it was a uh, feedback system, mm -hmm. cerebellar hemorrhage. Uh, we would misdiagnose or, the, or, or miss the diagnosis uh, repeatedly. And uh, for, for, I don't know, years or months, uh, we, could, we could not figure out how to diagnose a, a cerebellar hemorrhage. And of course, we had to wait for autopsy to, to show that there was a cerebellar hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. So there we would use the, the two. In those days, diagnosis was uncertain. Mm -hmm. See, even now with, uh, all, with uh, all the mm -hmm. uh, methods used now, uh, diagnosis sometimes uh, uncertain. Is that right? Yes. Well, in those days, every, every, every case was a, was a problem. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you, you had to have an autopsy you, or you wouldn't know, uh, mm -hmm. you couldn't be guided at all. So the answer to that is that the pathology was of course, very important for the yeah, clinical. It was kind of instrumental. And I, I remember, at least when I was there, which was 1969, the only thing we really had was angiography. And those were single views, hand-pulled films with hand injections that we did. And actually, you uh, supervised a lot of the angiography. Yes, well, that, it was still da uh, somewhat dangerous, and yeah. uh, we hesitated to use it uh, freely. And, and uh, Did you do some of the angiography yourself in oh, the early oh, years? Oh, yes, right. You did? Mm -hmm. Right. So it sounds like that was a very exciting time, those early kind of years at the, at the Mass General. Well, as I say, something, something new came up almost, mm -hmm. uh, uh, say every hour would be an exaggeration, but mm -hmm. every every day and every week and every case, every mm -hmm. patient uh, was a, uh, I think I, it was at that time I, I uh, adopted the, the term, a, a test case. Every, every case is a test case <laughs> because it tested us because we didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So, and that mm -hmm. still pertains to even mm -hmm. now that you, yes. there's always something to be learned yes. about. Uh, what, what would be your, your modus operandi if you had a, uh, a, a problem. Would, would you generate at that time hypotheses or would you acquire data or how would you go about uh, settling an issue or settling a problem? Yeah, now you're getting into a uh, method of discovery and so yes. forth and uh, uh, I suppose we, uh, we do establish hypotheses without, without calling it that. It's uh, like, uh, I wonder if there's anything in this rather than, than mm -hmm saying what's in it. Is there anything in this? This is unusual. I wonder if it means anything. And then collect data. Mm -hmm. So that isn't quite an hypothesis except for um, uh, let, let's have a let's have a further look here. Mm -hmm. And it was really, and I, I want to get on the collecting part of it because mm -hmm. I, I remember that kind of very vividly and I think one of the things that you did a lot of is have different manila folders which mm -hmm. were collections of interesting things. R right. So that, mm -hmm. and, and at that time you didn't let yourself be biased by an answer. In other words, you're really collecting information at the, is that? 
Is large large uh, classifications? Uh, uh, is that right? Large large categories. Mm -hmm. And when I started out, uh, do you see I had uh, almost everything uh, was in one category, yeah. and then carotid and non carotid. You see, and then lacunes and non lacunes, and uh, so they, it gradually got w winnowed down to uh, sp special problems. Mm -hmm. So the number of different Files grew. Yes, say? tremendous. I remember them all, all over. Yeah, right. And, yeah. And, and this time you were very much uh, involved also in looking at serial sections. Right. Every, yes, I did and everything. I did and, everything yeah. in serial sections. So it was really a lot of time. And you spent a lot of time at the hospital in those years. Well, about 12 hours a day yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And Coming in about what time? It would be usually in by nine, mm -hmm. half past eight. Right. Now, the, the milieu. How, in looking back on it during that time, how do you view that? I mean, do you, do you, was it really uh, them being supportive and letting you do your work, or what, was there also some uh, major interaction that the other people were doing with you? What, the, the, uh, you mean... Uh, people at the Mass General. The fellows or the uh, uh, well, both. staff? Maybe say a little word about that. Well, uh, that was the, at that time was the only way, there was the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. you, you had to get the clinical data mm -hmm. and uh, then try and get the pathological follow-up. And uh, to, and then I was always interested in, in the thoroughness in the clinical, mm -hmm. so that's a slow process. And, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, I was never conscious of, uh, of uh, bearing down and uh, uh, by direct effort, mm -hmm. like making an, a great effort to be thorough. I, I was, mm -hmm. it, it wasn't that at all. The, the uh, being thorough uh, was the only way to go. It wasn't, mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't an effort, uh, mm -hmm. I would say. I was always... Mm -hmm. Same thing with serial sections. That you, to do it, you had to do it right. You had to do it in, in detail. Right. So yeah. this, uh, what was the relation, or how did you think about the fellows at that beginning? How did that work out? Because in those times, it was very unusual to have fellows. I mean, the fellows mm -hmm. were supported mostly by NIH uh, money. Yes, that? right. Mm -hmm. Well, they wanted to learn clinical neurology. They may not have been interested in stroke, but they mm -hmm. wanted to learn to have another year at clinical neurology, and that's, mm -hmm. again, why we were somewhat thorough and uh, persistent uh, in uh, looking at each case. Mm -hmm. And how, now looking back upon it, um, how do you view the, the fellows as interworking with you and what you were doing and, and your, your well, role in, in working with them? In other words, how did you, how did you visualize well, that? Well, they were, uh, uh, they were, uh, uh, my bulwark. They were they were no, extremely important. They asked the questions and, and mm -hmm. uh, handed it to me on a platter, sort of thing. So that um, uh, uh, the it was a thoroughness, I think, that uh, uh, with, with which we went at each problem, mm -hmm. and, uh, and realizing that 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 neither they nor I understood this. To any extent at all, and so it was a, so it was a mutual mutual ignorance. Uh, but I depended on them entirely. They, uh, they during the day they were seeing uh, mm -hmm. all the stroke cases in the hospital, and, uh, and mm -hmm. I, I would make rounds with them, trying to see everybody. Mm -hmm. And it, it sounds like, and I mean, there there are really three aspects, aren't there? One of them is the thoroughness and detail. The other, I think, is the seriousness. That you know that these are problems to be solved. That you really, if you work at it, you have to be serious at it and and take the uh, the study part of it seriously. And the third really was the golden opportunity of having all this material, clinical and pathological, that really very few people had done. So it was really a a gold mine of opportunity that had to be taken seriously and thoroughly mm -hmm. and. For advancing the art. Yes, for learning yes. something. So yes, it, right, it, yes, it, it right, was yeah. almost a little bit like we were. It was a graduate school, where there was very little pre pre precedent for that. That the students were serious learners, 
and you were seriously studying the issues. And <laughs> yeah, we were I, learning I, how I, to study it from you. It's, it's probably true that, uh, uh, that uh, I hadn't thought of it, that uh, 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 none of us knew where, where we were going. Yeah. And uh, so it was a, a, a mutual. Mm -hmm. And I never thought of them as fellows uh, mm -hmm. as, as much as uh, uh, fellow workers or uh, we're in this together. Or, no, I never thought of it as a... Mm -hmm. uh, as, as a but, but isn't, isn't it quite different from a lot of, I mean, afterward, uh, some of the NIH studies where they get you to sit down and you have to work out your hypotheses beforehand and you work out this beforehand and that beforehand. It really didn't transpire that way. It was ideas that kind of flourished and percolated. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a special form of discovery. Yeah. See, it, uh, if you're going out to, in the woods to discover something, uh, you've got no thesis. Uh, you, I'm, I'm looking for something. Well, what are you looking for? Well, anything that's anything that's new. Yeah. So that's what we were doing. We we're just uh, if it's, uh, and we could be sure. I thought that if we worked on something thoroughly, it would be new. Mm -hmm. That no one has ever bothered to to be this thorough with a with an individual patient mm -hmm. in certain in vascular disease. So yeah, no, I think that was true. Mm -hmm. Now. When some of the newer advances started to come out, CT first, then MRI, mm -hmm. it's, how did that work into what you were doing? Well, I think uh, I've said that uh, CT, we made, made more progress in, uh, in a year than we did in about 30 years okay. before that. Oh, yes, it changed. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, it was pathology in, in, in life. Mm -hmm. uh, it, interesting. Uh, remark uh, in April of uh, 1974 uh, there was a symposium at the uh, American Academy on uh, technology and uh, the remarks that I remember were that neuropathology is passe <laughs> that uh, even looking at me you mm -hmm. know that uh, you have to Get into the newer techniques, uh, they, uh, and, uh, uh, and and get with it, uh, or, or take uh, use chemistry more and so forth. And that was in April, and then in August, CT was 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 uh, introduced, and it emphasized that that neuropath was the only way that you could be introduced to that. Yeah. So and that yet you particularly having dissected all those brains. Mm -hmm. were particularly, you know, prepared to see what the images meant, what the brains look like. Right, yes, yeah. as a neuropathologist. Sure. Whereas a radiologist can't do... Had no idea. No, had no idea, and he can't do it yet. Yeah. He can't make that uh, at, at brain cutting, for example. He can't look at the, the uh, image and say, ah, oh, that's, that's, that caused that by looking at the brain. He doesn't know the pathology yet, so... Right. So immediately, all of our clinicians who had done neuropath were, were at home in CT. So the, the radiologist would say, do you agree? Do you, or do you, what do you think that is? And because they would say, well, it looks like edema to me or something like that, but without their knowing what edema meant, so um, mm -hmm. pathologically. So, mm -hmm. oh yeah, so, so it, it changed the, uh, an MRI, do you see this, um, made uh, pathology somewhat secondary have to be checked from time to time, but um, but the uh, easy pickings, as I say, are, are 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 seem to be in the in the past now. But I I, I don't know if that's true or not. It might mm -hmm. be just blindness. But um, uh, but but you saw the new changes as being an opportunity to to learn more and really advance a lot of the morphology. More. Oh, yeah, so t tremendous. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, yes. and, uh, mm -hmm. Now, did things change at all? I, I know that I guess it was somewhere around the early 70s that you were, that the fellows were more supervised. I guess that's the time when Jay Moore had come to the general as kind of full time, as the kind of he, second lieutenant. Right, that, yes, right. Um, before that, you had been pretty much on your own. You essentially were the stroke service and the fellows. Yeah. Yes, right. Yes, yes. So it's only, right. only. Uh, Did things change then in the early '70s as far as what you were doing, or how you saw your work, or how you saw what you were going to to uh, to do? Well, 
I have I've used what I call the 15-year rule, that there must be somebody coming behind me who's 15 years younger mm -hmm. and who knows as much as I do. And uh, so that when he gets to my age, he will have passed me. Mm -hmm. So that uh, J.P. Moore, I thought, was, was my 15-year follower. Mm -hmm. So that it looked as, he was, as if he was going to stay at the Mass General. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I spoke with Ray, and, and, uh, and he agreed that, that I could pass the mantle to, to Jay. To mm -hmm. And then Jay began to really directly supervise the fellows. Yeah, I still went around most yes. of the time. Yes, yes. I still, no, I for the first uh, number of years with Jay, I, I, still, mm -hmm. I still went around. Yeah. Now, did your activities at that point change at all? I mean, did you devote yourself to any different things than before? Not, not really, mm -hmm. no. I'd, I've always been interested in, in clinical syndromes so mm -hmm. that uh, uh, I, could, I could switch from, from clinical to clinical pathological quite quite easily. Mm -hmm. and, and, and NIH was still supporting me, I think, at that time. They, uh, they were, uh, I never had a grant turned down, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but they were trivial uh, grants. And, um, uh, and I always had the work done before I put in the grant yeah. for it. <laughs> so when I, uh, so when I said uh, I proposed to do so and so, I had already done it. I, I hadn't published it or anything like that, but I knew that that it was feasible and so forth. And I, in writing a grant, I, uh, I don't know if I've told you this, that I allowed 24 hours. I started at 12 noon on Saturday, and it had to be finished by 12 noon on Sunday. Huh. So I never spent any, because I knew I had done it already. Do you see? So I just had to sort of justify it in some way. And uh, so they were very short. They had all the, mm -hmm. the uh, proper divisions mm -hmm. of the grant, but they were all brief mm -hmm. because there was no, uh, I, I knew it was feasible. So, uh, mm -hmm. And whether the question of whether it was worthwhile, but mm -hmm. any clinical advance to me is worthwhile. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's hard to refute that mm -hmm. they might say it's trivial, mm -hmm. but no one knows that. Mm -hmm. Not until you make that step, you sure. see. It. And I, I think actually you're still working on a number of projects, is that? Oh, yes, right. What, no, what, what would you say you're working on mostly now? Well, I don't uh, have, I see my lab closed in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in about, uh, it closed about uh, 16 years ago or more, 16 years ago. The so, neuropathy. Yes, where I did my serial section. So that, mm -hmm. so I, had, I might have, I might have had 50 further projects that I could have used zero sections for, but I've never succeeded in getting anybody to, to do them. They're so time consuming. Now they become very expensive. Expensive. And, and, uh, but worthwhile things that would stop uh, 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 idle thinking. Do you mm -hmm. see? It's a, if you got a fact, then you can go on with something else. Uh, so that was a great, a great loss uh, as, as far as I was concerned. Mm -hmm. and, but I felt that, um, that once I became 65, I should not take any money from the government, that it should mm -hmm. go to young people. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I guess I'm, in my, I'm the only one who thinks that. But I did make the suggestion to our, our research uh, mm -hmm. uh, society that, that um, that money should not come to us after the age of 65, but deliberately put it into younger people. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I didn't. Um, that was the reason, perhaps, that the lab closed. And well, once you don't have a, a path, or so you're now into clinical syndromes, and that's mm -hmm. what I've been working with. It's not not been very fruitful, but. Uh, uh, and you were interested in clinical syndromes, even those that weren't related to stroke. Oh, the yes. The Fisher oh. syndrome, there were a number oh. of other ones. Oh, yes, oh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. oh, yes. So mm -hmm. you always really maintained an interest in general neurology and general medicine, is that? Yes, uh, in, uh, in signs and symptoms. Yes. As, uh, as leading to diagnosis or syndromes leading to diagnosis. So always, uh, they're out there, they're still out there. Mm -hmm. I feel that every case instructs me. Mm -hmm. Every patient instructs me. I, mm -hmm. 
even now. I, I just never never see a, what I would call a uh, an end of the road. Mm -hmm. No, it's, a, it's a, mm -hmm. because everybody, I think, I say everybody, it's an exaggeration. Everybody stops short of the of the ultimate, mm -hmm. just by the time and so forth, mm -hmm. so that I have time to go uh, one step forward, I, I think. Mm -hmm. so, uh, mm -hmm. As you look back on it, you, you, you think back, what would you like people to kind of remember about your work? If you had to pick a few, few aspects, what would you think were the, the most important? Uh, I mean, of the subjects or, or, the, or, of or, or method. methodology method, or, or no. anything? Well, what, 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 do you, what, do you, what would you like people yeah. to remember you for? Yes, there's another whole dimension of, uh, of precision and, uh, and uh, persistence and, uh, and uh, emotion forward. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's that other whole dimension mm -hmm. that, that can be worthwhile. Nothing comes very easily, but there is something to be gained by persisting at, uh, mm -hmm. in the, with the idea or the mulling or the collection of data and so forth. Mm -hmm. Now, it's it's getting tough to to make any progress now, and and as you probably know, I've been more into uh, uh, brain mind or mm -hmm. neurology mind uh, mm -hmm. to uh, mental function. Uh, the feeling that a neurologist, knowing everything else, should be able to have an idea how the brain works and uh, how the mind works and uh, what the mind-brain uh, interface might be. And uh, well, that's hard going. It's difficult to prove anything. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, there you can have an hypothesis, mm -hmm. you see, and then test it and find out you're all wrong and so forth. So that's uh, uh, a... Um, mm -hmm. um, but that's what I've mm -hmm. been doing the last uh, mm -hmm. five or ten but years. But it sounds like a lot of it is the method and the approach to problems that is is a key thing that you think is is important it has to start with the with the with the facts of the mm -hmm. patient i think mm -hmm. and and what do they mean and um uh, whether it be um uh, or hysteria or something mm -hmm. like that um uh, or um you don't want me to to uh brain mind uh, sort of thing whether mm -hmm. they're uh, how the mind <laughs> how these little these fil this filigree mm -hmm. produces consciousness eh? it's, it's a how, how it works yes right so yeah. what what is the what is the generalization about that is, mm -hmm. is, a, is a does a dog have a has a dog have a thought or an idea, or what is it? Mm -hmm. What does it? Uh, but what about subjects? If you look back on the various kinds of mm -hmm. things you've worked on, carotid disease, hemorrhagic infarction, we've talked about lacoons, cerebellar hemorrhage, a lot of the work on intracerebral hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. There have been lots of things. Which do you think is uh, the thing that you're you're most proud of, or that you you? Uh, well, uh, all of it is just is just being uh, say first. Because the the uh, it's going to be found uh, five years later anyway, so it doesn't really make any difference. The most you could say is that you're first, or um, and I and I don't necessarily like that uh, competition part of, of medicine. But um, um, I would say that uh, that it's a method and thoroughness, and that there's more out there. That that would be my uh, you can take almost any field, and uh, if you pursue it in depth, uh, there will be a, a reward in, 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 in advancing knowledge. Mm -hmm. What about people? As you, as you look back, I mean, there are a few people we've, we've, you've mentioned. One is Walter Penfield, mm -hmm. the other is Dr. Adams. Mm -hmm. Is there anybody else that, you know, as a role model that you think was important in your, in your career and your life? Well, uh, Derek Denny Brown uh, taught me that there's a uh, that there's the ability to know everything about about a subject in its totality. Mm -hmm. Now, see, I'd I'd never met anybody like that. Mm -hmm. um, the only person who came close to that mm -hmm. was the 
professor of medicine at Hopkins and uh, who was interested in uh, myasthenia. Amy McGee Harvey. Right. McGee Harvey, yeah. Now, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that uh, from his writings, he that he looked at something in, in a global way, that uh, it was just like a polished gem. Everything that was known was fitted in, and what wasn't known was obvious and where to go. Mm -hmm. that, that I think that was, I think he was good at that. Mm -hmm. Derek Denny Brown knew everything, no matter what it was. And pathology, too, is very, mm -hmm. very good. And then Raymond Adams knew everything in a, a less flamboyant way. He, mm -hmm. uh, he just... It's more methodical and a different. Well, I don't know if he has method. I don't. I don't know if he has method. It just uh, the, the stuff goes in and out comes the answer. And uh, where it comes from, I don't know. It's a, it's a, that's unique. I would say that he's the greatest figure in in neurology that I've come across in my days. Uh, uh, far ahead of, far ahead of most. I, I don't know of anybody who, you probably know some who are. Who would match him? But mm -hmm. uh, he's—I don't know. Another neurologist could even carry his bags. It's uh, mm -hmm. its its that remarkable to hear it day in and day out. Mm -hmm. uh, Anyone else? Well, I suppose I have to. And I'm indebted to the fellows. They, they instructed me. They they asked the questions. You see, and they point out something I wouldn't notice. They pointed out. And, and yet in all my writings, uh, hardly any fellows have ever joined me. I tell them, I, I, that's very interesting, I would write that up. Mm -hmm. never, doesn't, nothing happens. Doesn't uh, leave it for a year or two or something like that. It, would, it won't, won't quite happen. Now, and, see, I don't, I don't understand that. See, I'd, uh, whether, whether, in my own case, uh, whether uh, I, I, I might have called it spoon feed, that uh, that somebody spoon fed me, namely uh, Raymond Adams and uh, the and the resident in, uh, mm -hmm. but the resident in neuropathology he didn't know as much about it as, as I did really. Sure. I, I don't think he had an internship. Is that I think right? He was right, mm -hmm. right from medical school. Mm -hmm. So that I, I think that. Um, uh, that looking back, that that I should spoon, I should have spoon-fed somebody with all the facts or something, or mm -hmm. get them well started. Now write it, write it up. Mm -hmm. But I, I think part of the methodology, at least as I remember, you see, I, I think that part of it was that you were always a serious student, and part of what you wanted to do with the fellows is get their ideas about it without influencing or biasing them and teaching them how to study it. I think it would, it would not have been your, your way of doing things like a by telling them a things. Socratic. That's right. It's really a Socratic technique, which uh, it, it would have been hard for you, I think, to be didactic with them. Well, I probably didn't know. Well. But, but see, if, if, if I would say something, I would expect to be uh, challenged uh, yeah. in, in a... Uh, uh, in a uh, congenial way, you see that to me the the whole thing is is exchange again. I, I haven't okay. emphasized that that uh, I expect to be challenged, and I and I I tend I think to challenge other people because they say uh, that I. My most favorite expression is, oh, is that so? <laughs> do, you, do you agree with that? Yes. Someone just told me that recently. They said, you've got that, oh, oh, oh is that so? Uh -huh. And I, am, I was unaware of that. Or A, <laughs> which is an open, you know. Yes, yeah, so how, like, how do you get that way? Something like that. Uh, but it would always be in a congenial, uh -huh. uh, congenial way. I've, I've, uh, yes, in the spirit of learning. Yes, right. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there anything else? that we ought to talk about in this setting you think that, I, that we've missed that you think is important? Well, uh, uh, medicine is changing and uh, whether there's any room for uh, clinical advance uh, is the, would be a major question. If, if, if I were doing it all over again, mm -hmm. in, this, in this age, what would I do? Mm -hmm. And 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 I would not uh, do the clinical. Mm 
mm -hmm. knowing what we know up to this uh, this time. No, I would have to get into the science. I'd have to get into a chemistry or, or mm -hmm. something like that because that's obviously where the where the future is in understanding uh, or curing mm -hmm. disease. I never entered the field of causation. I always avoided that. What causes atherosclerosis? I had to shut that off, except what I read and things like that, but I couldn't get interested in that myself because that's a, a lifelong study, mm -hmm. atherosclerosis. Uh, tumor, it's its, uh, its own study, you see. So I st studied the nervous system in action as part of a, 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 a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. That's that's a, 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 a special a special avenue. I, I would say that I don't know who is doing that uh, at the present time. I look around to see uh, who is who is bearing down and at the at the fringes of. of uh, of knowledge about the nervous system action as seen in the clinic. Mm -hmm. I guess Marsden mm -hmm. might be one. I, I think that uh, his people are right at the mm -hmm. at the edges. Um, um, do any others come to mind? Uh, there are good clinicians around here and there that I, mm -hmm. I uh, see. Uh, but it's a dying breed. For for advance of the of the of uh, knowledge. Yes, this is special mm -hmm. knowledge. Now we're, the wave now is the causation of disease. Mm -hmm. See, and, and you might be able to pull something off in the clinic by studying the biology of the disease, like noticing mm -hmm. that somebody eats a lot of liver and doesn't have an anemia. Mm -hmm. I like to think that that's, that that's possible, that I could be out studying multiple sclerosis and learn more about what to do for it than all of the laboratories investigating. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the challenge for me if I was going to do multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Two more, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how to go about that. So these other things I believe have to be, they fall under the causation of disease and uh, obviously genetics, so you mm -hmm. have, to, have to know chemistry and, mm -hmm. and so forth. But, um, so I would do it differently if I was starting in, in say, uh, 1990. I would mm -hmm. get a, a different different background and, mm -hmm. and so forth. But I feel that I would be able to do just the same in that as I would do in the clinical. Because of the methodology. Yeah, right. It's a, and you see the hypothesis. Mm -hmm. It it isn't quite an hypothesis. That mm -hmm. uh, and, and I know in your, obviously the literature is filled with. Formation of hypothesis, and I never, I never realized that I would, mm -hmm. that what I call what I'm doing is not uh, hypothesis forming. It's a. Is it serious collecting? Is that uh, fair enough? I wonder. I wonder if there's anything in this, mm -hmm. without wondering what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, it's that, uh, that's interesting. I've never noticed that anybody, say, with a. Um, um, Morantic endocarditis. Uh, why that? Why that? Morantic plaque mm -hmm. uh, on the valve. Why that doesn't undergo dissolution? Mm -hmm. You see. So now it tells me I better look at the emboli it sends off and see if they undergo dissolution. Mm -hmm. Then if uh, putting two and two together, you see. Well, now there might be something in that. Now that's what I. Yeah. I don't know what it so is. It's really one idea generating another, and following, yeah. chasing yeah. the idea that, as it comes. Yes, right. I, and uh, it's it's discovery rather than investigation. Mm -hmm. So now that uh, that might be hard to uh, to uh, fathom, um, but to have the fellows go out and, and look for something, mm -hmm. see, it, it doesn't. Uh, if I stayed in my office and said, now go out and find something new, uh, not fair, eh? <laughs> whereas whereas uh, I have, uh, I have uh, 35 prongs going out there, do you see? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so, I'd, so we're back to, to whether, I, whether I should have spoon-fed, mm -hmm. how, how to get somebody 
uh, into the same mode as I am. Mm -hmm. and, uh, can you can you can that be trained into anybody? And mm -hmm. and that's of course a, a, a major question in science scientific circles. Can you train a young person to be scientific? Mm -hmm. And I'm not. Uh, I don't know where the, that debates stands mm -hmm. at the present time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you think we ought to uh, include here? Well, I, I haven't uh, emphasized. Uh, you personally, uh, uh, how proud I am of, of uh, that you came through the stroke service, and uh, mm -hmm. so that the those who were on the stroke service, I, I believe they were all better for it, mm -hmm. and uh, and particularly uh, you and J.P. Moore and Monroe Cole, mm -hmm. Herb Carp, mm -hmm. uh, uh, have stayed at what I call a highest level clinical endeavor and um, uh, it's, it's a it's a rarity mm -hmm. and, um, and I only hope that that you found it uh, enjoyable and stimulating as I have oh yeah no I think it's uh, changed my life mm -hmm. Dr. Fisher thank you for spending the time with me and with the audience I think it uh, I think it's a lot of the thoughts were very important ones to get across well, it's been a great pleasure to participate, and uh, I hope others will find it of some interest uh, here and there. Yeah, I'm sure they will. Good.